Después de la pausa café, seguimos adelante con la conferencia de la profesora Hildebrand. Mireille Hildebrand es jurista y especialista en filosofía del derecho, profesora de entornos inteligentes, protección de datos y el Estado de Derecho en el Institute of Computing and Information Sciences de la Radboud University Nijmegen, así como afiliada a la Erasmus School of Law en Rotterdam y al Center of Law and Science, Technology and Society Studies de la Universidad Libre de Bruselas. En 2008 publicó con Serge Goodbeer, Profiling the European Citizen, Cross Disciplinary Perspectives en Springer, y este año, en 2013, ha publicado junto con Katia de Vries, Privacy, Due Process and the Computational Term en Rowledge. Ambos tratan del desarrollo y las implicaciones de la minería de datos y el machine learning en el contexto del Big Data. Por lo tanto, como se desprende de esta breve lectura de su currículum, una especialista en los temas que nos reúnen aquí. Eh, Profesor Hildebrand, thank you for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm strengthening the Department of Law, Science, Technology and Society coming here. Um, so I'm going to, to start straight off. I'm going to read from my uh, notes and I hope that if there is something entirely unclear that you will interrupt me. Can you hear me in the back everywhere? Anybody cannot hear me? That's a better question. Okay. This is absolutely the wrong PowerPoint. That is, uh, my apologies, I uploaded the wrong PowerPoint. That's, uh, that's very funny. Okay, technology. I will have to change it. It may seem that we are slaves to technology here. <laughs>
it's, it's loading because it's got too many pictures. Who's putting too many pictures in presentations like this? <laughs> You wouldn't believe it, but here it is. My sincere apologies. Okay. The problem with big data, this conference is about big data, is that N is all. Or rather, the problem is the claim by some of its advocates and some of its adversaries that N is all. And is all nicely summarizes what big data is about, how it is defined, and which are its pitfalls. If it were true, big data could rupture any membrane that shields our inner lives, disrupting the most sacred place of both privacy and autonomy, because it would allow its masters to know us better and to know anything better than we do ourselves. If it were untrue, big data could still uproot our sense of self and our interface with the world to the extent that we cannot contest its outcomes, resist the seemingly clean, objective knowledge that it produces, and we do not have the tools to figure out how we are being profiled. So if untrue, big data will generate incorrect discrimination, but even if true, big data can generate unfair or even unjustifiable prohibited discrimination. Now the problem is, of course, that speaking in terms of true or untrue in relation to big data does not make sense, because big data is about data modeling top-down and bottom-up, automated and even autonomic. So the better question is whether the modeling works. What are its effects? How these effects are distributed? And finally, most importantly, what kind of humans we will become when interacting with the models that big data generates to figure us out? as if big data would have a mind of its own. I've already succumbed to speaking as if big data has a mind of its own. It would be so simple to deny this and to attribute all of its predictions to the designers of the technology. Big data is, of course, a technology or to its users. The advertising networks, data brokers, justice authorities, scientists, smart grid operators, and whatever other service providers that base their decisions to provide a credit, a job, an insurance on big data, or to whatever service providers that outsource their decisions to the high-speed, real-time, autonomic computing systems that increasingly determine our external environment. Take, for example, the preparations for the smart grid that will combine real-time processing of our energy usage data with flexible pricing to enable us to upload energy to the grid and to sell this to our nearest neighbors. Whoever is into computer science will understand the pun here. IBM has coined the term autonomic computing, suggesting that autonomous computing systems will adapt our external environment just like the autonomic nervous system runs our internal environment. Both would do that in ways to which we have no conscious access and over which we have no direct control. To the extent that big data is smart enough to operate autonomically, however, it must outsmart both its designers and its users. Big data is smart precisely because it generates solutions we could not have developed. 
we don't have enough computing power. So it generates an unpredictability similar to that of an animal. However well trained, we cannot entirely control its behavior. Worse even, it may generate the volatility of volcano eruptions, acts of God, as we once called them. It might be that to the extent that we worship big data, believe in it, and make ourselves dependent upon its oracles, it turns into a new pantheon filled with novel gods of our own making, but not under our control necessarily. So it might be wise to speak of data indeed as having a mind of its own without suggesting that its mind is like our mind and without forgetting that its mind is initially developed by businesses, scientists and government agencies to make a profit, to construct new knowledge and to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of public administration. Today I want to raise the question of the double contingency or mutual interdependence between big data, individuals, individual minds and human society. To do this I will first investigate how big data has been defined, including the provocations this has generated from those at home in the field of data science. I will then look into some of the solutions that have been offered for instance by the World Economic Forum, to re-establish some kind of balance between individual persons and the corporations who practically own the data relating to them. And then in the written text I will discuss one of the core principles of constitutional government, purpose binding, firmly rooted in the principle of legality, not to be confused with legalism, but as we all know, in the realm of personal data processing, this principle relates not only to big data in the hold of data-driven government, but also to the business models of private companies that monetize big data. To what extent is the sharing, selling and further processing of personal data beyond the context of its collection lawful and or ethical? Is big data analytics compatible with prior purpose specification? Or is function creep the holy grail of big data? Is cross-contextual data mining what makes for the added value in both science, business and administration? Must we rethink purpose specification as it is entirely at odds with the internal logic of big data? Sorry, that part will be in the written part. I will conclude by returning to the question of the mutual interdependence of big data, individual persons and human societies. Now let's start with defining big data. If you want to improve the performance of your website, you can do A-B research. It means that you make a small change in the layout or in the responses of your site A and direct half of your visitors to site A and the other half to site B. That is the one with the minor changes. You then log everything the users do, visitors do, and calculate how both versions of the site match with preferred behavior, say purchasing behavior. Instead of taking a sample of your website visitors and calling them or sending them an email, you just measure the behaviors of all your visitors and act on the findings. You no longer depend on the subset that responds. There is no bias from people who provide you with politically correct answers. You don't have to settle for what people say they did or will do. You can just calculate what they did, what they do, and what they will probably do. We, those vi visitors, are the guinea pigs Though nobody asked for our consent to engage in this experiment, nobody paid for our contribution to improve the performance of the website, and in fact, we never even noticed. In their breathtaking big data a revolution that will transform how we live, work, and think, Victor Meyer-Schoenberger and Kukia 
describe big data as referring to things one can do at a large scale that cannot be done at a small scale. This is an important starting point because obviously big data is not merely about a big bag of data. The complementary dimension that is part and parcel of the notion big data itself is constituted by the techniques to mine relevant patterns from stored and sometimes even streaming data. These techniques have been named knowledge discovery in databases and most of them are now associated with machine learning. And knowledge discovery in databases or KDD has been defined as the non-trivial process of identifying valid, novel, potentially useful and ultimately understandable patterns in data. Especially the understandable is very interesting. Machine learning has been defined as a machine learns with respect to a particular task, T, this is computer science thinking, performance metric, P, and type of experience, E, if the system re reliably improves its importance, its performance, P, at task T, following experience E. Both form the core of artificial intelligence, the modern approach, not to be confused with goofy, good old-fashioned artificial intelligence. The latter was based on deductive models, um, rule-based or case-based, assuming that intelligence could be modeled and replicated based on a formal model of human intelligence. The modern approach, notably machine learning, is based on the notion of agency, defined as the capability to be interactive, autonomous, and adaptive. I know that many authors still have doubts about machines that learn, but I think that it is more productive to admit that machines are indeed learning at high speed and both differently and similarly as we do. This does not imply that machines think like we do or feel as we may. It does raise the question of whether our own learning processes are beginning to change as a consequence of interacting with these machines. What does autocomplete do to our ways of writing? How does it impact our fluency in language? Which productive misunderstandings does autocomplete generate between communicating friends? Remember that Zizek wrote that communication is a successful misunderstanding meaning that we, never, that we can never really look into each other's minds, never be sure whether we mean the same thing with the same words, reminding us that this is not a problem to be solved, but a source of creativity. Is autocomplete, which nicely forebodes other types of smart environments, like ambient intelligence and the Internet of Things, is autocomplete also a source of creativity? Or does it aim for perfection, and will it in the end take over the production of meaning, but from the perspective of a machine? Will we internalize the drive for disambiguation that is inherent in machine language? Will we come to believe that disambiguity equals perfect communication? In other words, the question is not whether machines can really learn but whether we will become more like machines, because that will make it easier to anticipate how they anticipate us. And if so, is there something important in human learning, human thought and human feeling that we want to preserve? Let's, however, first follow uh, Maya Schoenberger and Cook here in their quest to explain big data. The analysis, their analysis starts with the notion of N is all. And this has already been foreseen by uh, uh, Chris Anderson in a famous article, I think in 2009, in Wired magazine under the title of The End of Theory. In traditional quantitative research, scientists that aim to uncover regularity in a population were forced to investigate a sample, relying on statistics to extrapolate from the sample to a population. Examining the whole population was simply impossible or too costly. A population, by the way, can be a set of people, but also 
A set of animals, plants, stones, landscapes, cells, molecules, or whatever other entity, event, or process. So the research starts with a hypothesis that is then tested on the sample, and the sample consists of n instances of the relevant population, suggesting that to the extent that the sample correctly represents the population, the findings of the sample hold for the population. Such traditional research requires developing a hypothesis, composing a representative sample, conducting the research and calculating the conclusions, which all takes time, expertise in the relevant subject matter, and depending on the kind of testing to be done, it may also require expensive instrumentation. Whatever the conclusion, they remain uncertain due to the fact that it is pos not possible to collect all the relevant instances of the population. Now, N is all means that the sample equals the population. It implies that the uncertainty generated by the jump from sample to population is absent in the case of big data, or more moderately formulated. It means that the exponential increase of N substantially reduces this uncertainty. This is linked to the idea that the availability of nearly all instances of a given population compensates for potential inaccuracies. Meyer Schoenberg and Cook here even claim that lack of precision in some instances will automatically be corrected by subsequent recording of further data. The growth of knowledge that is made possible by having N is all invites further datification, promising endless opportunity to mine the data in search of new relevant patterns. Why? Because these patterns may enable new business models or, in the case of public administration, new business cases for more efficient and effective governance. We can say that datification is the process of translating the flux of life into discrete, machine-readable, measurable, manipulable bits and bytes. Datification reinforces the illusion of N as all because it enables seemingly unlimited discretization due to the reduction of costs and the exponential increases in computing power. The current explosion of data actually does two things. First, it turns data into noise. The sheer quantity of bits and bytes makes them unreadable for the human eye. Second, to turn this noise into information or even knowledge, computational techniques of information retrieval have been developed and applied. And as indicated earlier, this is not merely about queries that retrieve original input, but increasingly about mining operations that retrieve patterns not previously uncovered invisible patterns derived from statistical inferencing. Data derivatives, as Louise Amor has called them so aptly, data derivatives that provide for present futures, which are anticipations of the future present. And as Elena Esposito has argued, these present futures will shape of course, the future present. The better the predictions, the present futures, the more people may act on it and thus change the course of the future present. In the meantime, as Maya Schoenberger and Kukier note, the speed with which new data become available and the speed with which correlations within the data can be mined and tested seem to suck the life out of the quest for causality. This seems to become an old school quest, a search for why in an era that, that works better on how, when, where, and depending on what, with no time to sort out the causes behind the correlations. Because by the time you have started on the investigation, the correlations may have been falsified, shown to be spurious, or simply followed up with novel correlations that work better. This point has been made many times by now, notably by Chris Anderson in his provocative Wild <coughs> magazine article, The End of Theory. And this has always made me feel that uh, these kind of data mining operations uh, 
are more in accord with a non-metaphysical philosophy of meaning, namely that of the pragmatist maxim of Charles Sanders Peirce. Charles Sanders Peirce was a notably difficult writing uh, uh, philosopher, but I still think it is interesting to quote his um, definition of meaning, the meaning of a concept. So he says, consider what effects which might conceivably have practical bearings we conceive the object of our conception to have. Then our conception of those effects is the whole of our conception of the object. Bottom line, look at what concepts do for you and don't muse about all sorts of essentialist metaphysics. And this seems to be exactly what data mining offers us. The next big thing that Meyer, Schoenberger, and Kukier discuss is the shift from expertise to uh, data analysis. This, there seems to be no field in which data analysis is not emerging as a game changer, realigning work processes, methodologies, business models, and cases. The exposure of the secret surveillance practices of the NSE by a system administrator are a case in point. To survive, both the industry and government must adapt their decision systems in line with data processing operations that progressively begin to dictate what is possible, enabling as well as limiting how we perceive the world. This then raises the question of free will. Meyer, Schoenberger and Kukier suggest that we are on the verge of data dictatorship meaning that we become incapable of conceiving reality outside the mediation of big data techniques and technologies, meaning that data, data mining, machine-to-machine -machine communication and computational decision systems may soon take over. So it seems that the authors start with somewhat unwarranted techno-optimism and finish with similarly unwarranted techno-pessimism. I will now briefly discuss the six provocations that I think were already mentioned this morning, developed by Dana Boyd and Kate Crawford against the big data conundrum. Big data is not just another, um, sorry, first of all, they agree that automated research changes our definition of knowledge. Big data is not just another addition to knowledge generation or management. It's a game changer. It implies another understanding of what counts as knowledge and creates different underpinnings for human, machine-to-machine, -machine, and hybrid decision systems. Contrary, however, to Maya Schoenberger and Kukier, they do not believe in and is all. Claims to objectivity and precision are misleading. I would suggest that this is related to the fact that any quantification presumes qualification to translate the flux of life into discrete machine-readable bits and bytes, we must qualify what counts as the same type of data. What realities fit what objects and attributes in the data models that are used to map big data. This entails interpretation. As has been noted, there is no such thing as raw data. Data are made just like facts. In line with this, Boyd and Crawford claim that bigger data is not always better data nor necessarily whole data. Sometimes small data is best data. Now here we have a truly revolutionary statement as far as the big data conundrum goes. I believe that for data scientists this is nothing very new or surprising. Time, human experience and computing power are scarce contrary to what some big data believers like to announce. The translation of entities, events, and processes into discrete data requires interpretation of such entities um, and reiterant anticipation of what a specific data model will effect and how it will enable and restrict the outcome of data mining operations. This relates to Boyd and Crawford's distinctions of social networks between breeding humans of flesh and blood on the one hand and behavioral networks or social graphs observed by the software machines of service providers on the other. Mistaking machine-readable behaviors 
for action seems to be part of the business case for predictive analytics. This may in fact, oh my dear, I did something wrong again. This may in fact trigger a situation in which behaviors draw the curtain on action. Who cares whether you had any reasons or intentions? If your behaviors correlate with your genetic disposition, match with your online social graphs, or with the combined data collected by government agencies in the course of your life. Morton Crawford does set the stage for two ethical issues. First of all, the question whether the fact that personal data are publicly available, like in social networking sites or on the internet, whether that renders their exploitation and monetization um, ethical, or does it? And the second ethical question is, should we accept the novel inequalities created by the knowledge asymmetries between data subjects and data controllers, or should we? Now, I'd like to add four epistemological issues that incorporate a number of less obvious, but I believe far more pervasive ethical issues. And the first is, well, traditional natural and social science starts from theoretical reflection that is tested by deriving hypotheses that can be tested against a sample that is called falsification, and it is supposed to create robust knowledge. Now, what does it mean to skip the theory and to limit yourself to generating and testing hypotheses against a population? Data science provides for a number of alternative techniques to detect patterns in data sets. And these alternative techniques have different outcomes. If public and private service providers mostly employ only one subset of these techniques because they have limited resources, what does that mean for the robustness of such outcomes? and for the extent to which they should inform the architecture of autonomic computing systems, where it becomes very difficult even for the designers to look inside the system, what it is actually doing. You need software verification experts, and there are not many around, they're very expensive, etc. In the old days, we said, if machine, uh, sorry, if men define a situation at real, it is real in its consequences, the famous Thomas theorem, popularized by Robert Merton. But maybe we must now admit that if machines define a situation as real, it becomes real in its consequences. What does that mean for the salience and the bias of the decision systems that depend on big data analytics? And finally, if the intestines of these decision systems are opaque to those affected by their operations, that's us, and even to those who operate them, if you talk neural networks, for instance, also the designer of the system and the user, the operator will not know what is happening inside. Where does this leave democracy and the rule of law? Are due process and fair administration informed consumer choice and the right not to be subject to invisible decision-making on the verge of becoming elusive concepts. Now let's go to some solutions that have been put forward quite recently, that are gaining traction quite recently. Let's put it that way. Let's return to the AB experiment. The data that are mined to improve the user experience or the website's performance or the profitability of the business model um, are not volunteered by the visitor. No forms are filled, no questions asked. The data here are observed data, and they usually consist of what is called behavioral data. In its project on um, rethinking personal data, the World Economic Forum recently launched a report under the title of Unlocking the Value of Personal Data from Collection to Usage. And one of the key aspects of their supposedly new approach includes, I quote, 
new ways to engage the individual, help them understand and provide them the tools to make real choices based on a clear value exchange. How poetic. This is very interesting. For a long time, the value of personal data has been related to an individual's personality. German legal doctrine, for instance, understands the fundamental rights to privacy and data protection as personality rights, meaning that they are related to the dignity and the autonomy of a person and should be seen as constitutive for the self, not something to trade with. Even in terms of consumer business relations, the legal framework of the EU data protection is focused on data minimization. Consumers should provide only the data that are necessary for a specific purpose and the usage is only lawful as long as this purpose or a compatible purpose holds. This also holds when the data are provided with consent, by the way. Once, however, we begin to think in terms of a clear value exchange and speak of personal data as a new asset class, the monetary value of personal data is indeed unlocked. In a previous report, the World Economic Forum actually highlighted this point by stressing the hidden potential of personal data as, I quote, untapped opportunities for social economic growth, unquote, urging a renewed discussion of collection and usage of such data that takes into account the current monetization of personal data. This renewed discussion should then start from an alternative typology of personal data clearly distinguishing between volunteered, observed, and inferred data. Traditional data protection legislation seems still focused on volunteered data. Even in the case of third-party access to personal data or in the case of legal obligations to provide data, volunteers' data were defined as created and explicitly shared by individuals, for instance, social network profiles. I would add that all the forms you fill, credit card data you consciously provide, are volunteer data. However, the business case for AB research, traffic management, NSE spying programs, law enforcement or fraud detection is another type of data. This other type, usually called Behavioral data is measured by the software machines that mine, share, and sell such observed data to attain uh, the holy grail of big data, which is inferred data. So we have volunteered, observed, and inferred data, and I dare say that these different types of personal or even unpersonal data, because the inferred uh, data will probably be unpersonal data, I would say that these need uh, differential legal protection. It is one thing to consent to the sharing of credit card data in order to buy something online, or to the sharing of a photograph posted on Facebook, but an altogether other thing to consent to machine-to-machine -machine sharing of your online behaviors, or to the sharing of your public transport behaviors, or your biometric behaviors, your gait, the way you move your hand, etc. Moreover, the inferred data, profiles for instance, derives from data mining anonymized, aggregated data may have the highest impact on a person. If three or four data points of a person match inferred data, a profile, which is not personal data and does not fall within the scope of the data protection legislation, she may not get the job she wants, her insurance premium may go up, law enforcement may decide to start checking um, her email or she may not gain access to the education of her choosing. Did I show this one? Yes. Um, under the EU data protection framework, there's a right not to be subjected to such profiling to the extent that it is fully automated. There are three major exceptions to that, consent, contract, and legal obligation. And if an exception applies, there is a transparency right. We must be told that the profiling has determined the decision and we must get information 
on how different factors were weighted. To become an effective right, those who employ the data analytics that significantly affect a person, as the law says, should provide transparency on the back-end system, what is the software actually doing, in a clear and comprehensible manner. And since we don't want to be fully dependent on those who own the data centers and machine learning technologies to provide the transparency, we will need our own transparency tools on the front end of the system. For instance, a platform owned by consumers that allow to share and mine consumer data to predict how this data will probably be monetized or used by law enforcement, employing inference engines, data mining machines, on the side of the user to counter profile the profilers, to guess how we're being anticipated, to read how we're probably read, to preempt how our intentions are being <coughs> preempted. This brings us to the solutions currently proposed. After the failure of large-scale employments of pets, followed by the notion of privacy by design, the new kid on the block is called personal data management. I'm not going into the technicalities, but I will refer to the definition of Bas and Nguyen, of context-aware personal data management, um, and they define that as an ICT application that this is still a very enormous um, uh, uh, definition. They say it is something that enables an individual to control the access and use of her personal data, not just identity management, in a way that gives her sufficient autonomy to determine, maintain, and develop her identity as an individual, which includes presenting aspects, attributes of her identity dependent on the context of her transactions and enabling consideration of constraints relevant to personal preferences, cultural, social, and legal norms. I could imagine that whoever heard this first doesn't know whatever I'm talking about, but think about the always used example of somebody who goes to buy alcohol. Um, the seller has, needs to know only one thing. Is that person above 18 or below 18 or 16 or whatever it is? Hmm? But you basically identify yourself with a whole lot of extra data. These type of systems will take care. There is only one attribute provided and uh, proved. Well, lots of vague terms here, but sometimes being more specific means reducing protection. Defining notions such as sufficient context consideration will be necessary, but every further definition will also reduce the applicability of the concept. So I think we should leave that to the operational level, which is very much still emerging. Now, PDM is interesting because it simply acknowledges that personal and other data are already being monetized and accepts that this has consequences for those to whom the data relate and especially for those to whom data derivatives relate are applied. Instead of struggling against monetization, it seems to embrace the idea that this will create added value, but also demands um, that those whose data are used as a resource get a share of the profit. We could actually apply the legal philosopher John Rawls's Maximin principle here. Whoever manages to create added value is entitled to a bigger share of the cake, as long as the least advantage do not see their share diminished. And Rawls's idea was if we all share the same cake, distribution should in principle, fair distribution, be equal. But whenever somebody manages to enlarge the cake, distribution may be somewhat unequal in order to incentivize such an enlargement. The side constraint being that this may never mean that those who had the smallest shares get even less due to skewed distribution. So personal data management should not create asymmetries that make us 
citizens, consumers, worse off in terms of our share of the monetary value than before the advent of big data analytics. This would, still, this would entail engaging us, engaging us as data subjects in the monetization and allowing us to gain part of the profit. It also sustains the incentive to invent applications for big data analytics because whoever creates added values get a good, gets a good share of the profits. Now, obviously, there are other reasons to engage citizens and consumers in the creation of added value. It should basically enhance our autonomy, allow us to figure out how we can influence autonomic computing systems, decision systems, compensate for the knowledge asymmetries that would otherwise subsist. In short, it should reinstate the system of checks and balances for the rule of law. In a way, it should reinvent the rule of law for the era of big data not merely in relation to government, but also in relation to other big players that may sometimes be more powerful than a government. I do have concerns, however. The main question is to what extent PDM may simply be co-opted by the industry and government agencies to further monetize our data, precisely by involving our initiative. For instance, what happens if we can foresee what behaviors will increase the monetary value of our behavioral observed data? What comes from the awareness that we can make money by matching those inferred profiles that turn us into profitable entities? When shall we start reading specific content just because it enables monetization instead of reading content that is of no interest to data brokers advertising networks, and viral marketeers? Are we going to be influenced by the automated micropayments that will accompany our machine-readable behaviors? Will this turn us, the observed clusters of data points, into slaves of big data? Or will it? Here comes the part that I'm not going to discuss purpose binding, which is of course very much related to this um, cartoon. I now want to reintroduce the question of the impact of big data analytics on our mind, self, and society. Mozorov, Morozov, sorry, I think a previous speaker at this conference, has nicely summarized the drawbacks of the imagined omniscience and as all with the solutionist mindset of Silicon Valley's geeks. In his latest book, he reminds us that, I quote, imperfection, ambiguity, opacity, disorder, and the opportunity to err, to sin, to do the wrong thing, all of these are constitutive of human freedom. And any concentrated attempt to root them out will root out that freedom as well. Legal philosopher Roger Brown's work actually said the same thing with regard to techno-legal solutionism. If technologies enable us to enforce compliance, we are no longer in the realm of law. To qualify as law, we need the right to disobey the law, the effective right to disobey the law, to challenge its validity in the view of higher legal norms and to contest its application in particular cases. The checks and balances of the rule of law and the division of tasks between legislator, administration, and the courts imply that law appeals to reason and is not set in stone. Whenever technologies begin to enforce compliance, we are, I would say, in the realm of administration or discipline. If big data allows a persistent, subliminal, preemption of our intent if it auto-completes our environments on the basis of inferred preferences and enables the kind of calculated nudging that will turn us all into abiding, friendly, healthy, and productive fellows, we should shrink back and reconsider. So we should not be fooled by the techno-optimists that may have their own reasons to nudge us into auto-completion.
But neither should we be overly impressed by techno-pessimists that announce the end of times. Though it is correct to observe that at the moment we are fair game for smart environments that entice us to turn ourselves inside out while becoming addicted to the latest app. But I think we learn, just like machines that run the code of the latest form of artificial intelligence, we learn. I'm, I'm just throwing in these slides as side thoughts. Because the question is, what do we stand to learn here? As indicated above, the bottom line is that we must invent ways to anticipate how smart, <coughs> sorry, how smart environments anticipate us, to guess how we are being read, and to figure out how current futures are inferred, and how they will influence our future currency. Because whereas machines can develop present futures, predictions of our future behaviors, there will be only one future present. To come to terms with smart data-driven environments, we must learn how to outsmart them, to stay one step ahead of them while they try to stay one step ahead of us. Now, this may sound very exhausting, but it need not be. On the contrary, this is where we come from and what we cherish in human society, the reiteration of mutual double anticipation. Sociologists have called this double contingency of human interaction. It is what constitutes both human society and individual selves. It is what makes for uncertainty about whether we mean the same thing, whether if, when referring to a particular word, press, pressing us, this is also very interesting. Um, is that a bell that rings that I have to stop? No. <laughs> pressing us for techniques and technologies that stabilize meaning despite its inherent instability. Double contingency means that I need to anticipate how you will understand me to be able to make sense. George Herbert Mead called this taking the role of the other, imagining how another sees us, and thus being born as a person, developing a sense of self. When I tell a young child, you are Sally, while pointing at her and saying, and I am Mireille, while pointing at myself, the child will repeat and say, you Sally, while pointing to herself, and me, Mireille, I, Mireille, while pointing to me, because the child is just repeating me. I will correct her, but she will be surprised, repeating both the gesture and the name. Now, the moment that Sally understands that to me she is you, while to herself she is I, she is born again capable of taking the perspective of another to herself. Mm -hmm. Now she is capable of reinventing herself, predicting herself, reflecting on herself, provo provoking expectations of herself, and ultimately being provocative by violating those expectations. This is actually where our sense of humor and our human freedom emerge. And such freedom cannot be reduced to consumer choice or to freedom from external constraints. It is tied up with the ability to review our oneself and to change course based on how we foresee that our actions will be interpreted. And all this is made possible by taking the perspective of another. This is why philosopher Ricoeur spoke of <coughs> oneself as another. And this is also why Cizek remarked that communication is a successful misunderstanding. Not just any misunderstanding, but one that succeeds in what? In nourishing the productive ambiguity of human language, allowing to act in concert despite recurrent shifts in meaning, in generating new meaning from the interstitious of unintended misunderstandings, thus opening the floodgates for new ways of seeing the same things which does become other things. 
allowing us to play around with the implications of our actions, reviewing them with new eyes, those of other others. Now what happens if it is machines that anticipate us, <coughs> and what happens if we begin to anticipate how profiling machines anticipate us? To become oneself in a smart environment, we have to take the perspective of inferencing machines. While the machines are trying to figure us out, we will try to game the system and decide for ourselves whether we are indeed the type of person they have calculated. If personal data management systems enables us to guess the value of our personal data, the double contingency will be reinstated. We will develop the technologically mediated capacity to guess how we are predicted and learn how to preempt the preemption of our intentions. That sounds good. However, there are three caveats here. Um, and I'm, I'm in the closing phase. The first relates to the question of what happens if machines anticipate us. We should admit that they can only take into account machine-readable data, and their inferences are contingent on a population consisting of machine-readable data, and therefore can never be all, because not everything can be discretized. Datification is both a multiplication of reality, um, a virtualization, actually, in the sense of Deleuze, and a reduction of reality, because it necessarily translates the flux of life into discrete data points. This is, of course, the same for written language. But with written language, it is visible for those who learn to read and write, whereas computer language is still the secret of the experts. The second relates to the question of what happens to us if we begin to anticipate these machines. Shall we, while figuring out how machines think, become more like machines and lose some of the ambiguity inherent in the usage of spoken and written language? Is Christian, this is a surname of an author, right that instead of machines becoming more like humans, we are slowly becoming more like machines. Is Marianne Wolf right that the morphology and the behavior of our brains is changing and that we must ask the question, what must be preserved? Highlighting that we cannot take for granted that our brains will adapt without losing what was developed in the course of our evolution as reading animals. The third point relates to the transparency that should reinstate the double contingency. The PDM model described earlier may enable intuitive transparency by means of monetization. The introduction of a tertium comparation is the third thing that makes things comparable, translatable into each other, hmm? money, um, in the form of money, huh? a price, could empower us to foresee how our data points match inferred behavioral models. But as we have seen earlier, this may create perverse incentives. The question is, however, whether we have alternatives. Currently, the transparency that is provided whenever prior informed consent is required creates a buffer overflow. Buffer overflow is a term used by computer security experts it means that you flood a certain part of a system with data and because it cannot contain all the data, the extra data go into other parts of the software and that is where they can have a very dangerous and manipulative effect. This is one way of attacking a software system. Now this is a very nice metaphor. Transparency, if it is uh, made, given in the form of long privacy policies, for instance, text, seems to act like a buffer overflow. The amount of information it involves floods our bounded rationality and this enables manipulation by what escapes our attention. As I've written elsewhere, though some would applaud the enlightenment of Descartes' idée claire et distinct, others may point out that these ideas may generate overexposure. Wrongly suggested suggesting the possibility of light without shadows. 
The metaphor of buffer overflow actually suggests that we may require selective enlightenment, that we are in dire need of shadows. The more interesting question, therefore, will be what should be in the limelight and where we need darkness. In Renaissance painting, the techniques of the clair obscure, the chiaroscuro, the hell dunkel, were invented and applied to suggest depth and to illuminate what was meant to stand out. By playing with light and shadow, the painting could draw the attention of the onlooker, creating a peculiar experience of being drawn into the painting, as if one is standing in the dark, attracted by the light. Big data analytics invites us to reinvent something like a clair obscure, a measure of transparency that enables us to foresee what we are in for. This should enable us to contest how we are being clustered, framed, and read, thus providing the prerequisites for due process. And this should finally enable us to play around with our digital shadows, acquiring the level of fluency that we have learned to achieve in language and writing. And I end this um, keynote a bit ashamedly with a reference to the enigma of the Sphinx on the cover of a book I recently co-edited. It depicts Oedipus in the clearing of a clair obscure. He stands out strong, willful, and looks somewhat impatient. The Sphinx stands in the shadow of a cave, potentially irritated that a trespasser has finally solved her riddle. However, though Oedipus may have solved the riddle, he cannot evade the fundamental fragility it foretells. The monetization of personal data points may help to reinvent a new version of the double contingency that constitutes our world, it cannot resolve the fundamental uncertainty that it sustains and should sustain. In fact, we need transparency tools that help to reinstate this uncertainty rather than the over-determination that monetization might otherwise enable. Thank you for your unmeasurable attention. Thank you for your interesting keynote. Disponemos de unos breves instantes por si alguien quiere formular alguna cuestión directa al hilo de lo que se ha presentado. Thank you, Mireya. It's a fantastic uh, uh, keynote and really raised a, a lot of different issues. I just want to focus on one in particular. Um, and this is that, as you know, uh, Many uh, American legal authors write books which are intended for a mass market rather than for uh, scholarly attention. Uh, and of course, it's very difficult to you know where the question's going immediately. I, I'm hoping that there will be a follow-up legal article by, uh, by Victor about the, the ideas in the final chapter of the book. Uh, and as you know, also, Morisov tends to speak to a wider audience as well. But I think it's really important that we do engage with these public policy uh, questions that, uh, uh, that you raise. I, I just wonder whether you have feelings about the fact that perhaps uh, the real privacy concerns that legal experts have are not being taken seriously enough uh, by the Commission and by others because they, they frankly find these issues too complex. And so the way in which the... Uh, the privacy regulation, if it ever happens, is, is really ignoring the real questions that you're raising here uh, and how, how we can actually engage with that. So uh, it's more about how do we get policymakers to, to listen to your speech rather than working in sound bites, uh, particularly on this issue. Yeah, well, I agree. The, the stakes at this moment are extremely high. We're talking about uh, billion dollar business big data. Um, I purposely chose to refer to to, um, to, to take Victor Meyer Schoenberger in Kukier's book, which actually quite surprised me because I've written other work of him and I find this a very shallow um, uh, book to some extent. Um, 
because he seems to be a big data believer. Uh, in, instead of opening the black box of, of big data, he's sort of contributing to the fact that it is um, uh, essentially something very great. And then in the end, suddenly saying that uh, we're now going to lose our free will. So this, these are contradictions I'm not very charmed by. Um, but I think it is extremely important to, to come to grips with big data. I also believe very much, and I've been writing about this for, for I think now eight years, that the current data protection directive and also the proposed regulation have wonderful transparency tools uh, in the current directive that is Article 15 in conjunction with Article 12 which, uh, for instance, have been translated into German law, the Data Protection Act, in a very interesting way, requiring for consumer transactions that are based on these sort of decision systems that um, serious trans uh, transparency is provided in a way that somebody can really understand, which makes the decisions contestable. Um, the the data protection regulation proposed, of course, adds data protection by design, and the combination of the new Article uh, 20 or 23, I forget, I think it's 20 uh, for uh, measures based on profiling and 23 for data protection by design, that combination is dynamite because if it is applied, then basically uh, the industry and also uh, information different governments has to provide the technologies to have easy, intuitive access to what is happening uh, based on these aggregates. So everybody's always talking about, oh, well, somebody shared a photograph on Facebook, and now so many people have seen it, and isn't that horrible? That's none of my concerns. I believe young people between the age of like eight and 20 have solved that. To them, is it simply a reputation system and they're already playing around with it. I'm worried about the fact that every move you make on Facebook is registered. Facebook has just, uh, I think at the beginning of the year, aligned with five large data brokers in the United States, one of which is Axiom, that has consumer data of 500 million consumers worldwide 1,500 data points per consumer. Now, all that information, hmm, so it's, it's uh, bringing together volunteered and observed. You could even anonymize it so that uh, some people think data protection uh, is no longer applicable. All that data is used to target you at a certain point. And we, we know all the anecdotes, I hope, about what that means. So I believe that the legislation is actually there. Nobody talks about Article 12 and 50. Nobody talks about Article 20.4, which says you need this transparency. Take the smart grid. It's going to be fully automated exchanges with flexible pricing based on all this. So I'm, I'm now more in favor of saying let's just go for it. Let's take care that Article 20 Article 24 survives, and I think it will because it's too complex. People don't understand the revolutionary nature of those articles. Let's go for it. Let's take care that this go to court. And um, in my opinion, that will mean that some of the business models that are currently around have to be tweaked. And I have no problem with that if you are a believer in capitalism then this is one fantastic way to, to draw out innovation, to say, okay, this is how we're going to construct the market. We don't want uh, to turn into slaves to big data. Uh, we want to have back some control. So uh, you develop now the transparency tools, the intuitive tools that we need. Sorry for a very long answer, but. Yes. Uh, I I very I like your idea of the uh, digital shadows. <laughs> I think it's very interesting. And one point is that always, and um, one of the re typical remedies would be information, but also it has its own uh, negative aspects. The more information, the less we know. And also something that um, may make. Um, uh, the fact that 
the, the subject is given more information, maybe it, mm, one of the consequences may be that he won't behave uh, as he would if he doesn't know that the others would know. Uh, as Irina said in her presentation, uh, if you know that they know what you are reading, what papers you are buying, uh, what films you are watching, then you won't behave yourself as you would if you didn't know. So maybe it's better to know less than, <laughs> than to know more. I'm just, it's a I, I think that's a very excellent comment. It's about self-surveillance uh, as a result of um, this whole machinery. And you're actually describing exactly what is my great concern with personal data management, that we're going to invite to all of us share this wonderful game of monetizing our data, which means, um, now I don't want to draw in Foucault all the time. Uh, I, I don't have any gods in terms of philosophers, but I think that uh, Foucault's little work on um, technologies of the self is very relevant here. So I do believe we need transparency, and I also believe we need intuitive transparency. We, we don't want text or banners appearing all the time. Um, monetization is one way, but monetization will definitely have the result, the consequence that you are describing, and that's why I'm very worried that um, it's going to change who we are. Now my question is, uh, th should we always remain who we are today? No, of course not. So I would, as some people like to say, embrace these sort of solutions. But then they must be then lawyers, you know, especially constitutional lawyers, lawyers who are, who are keen on thinking in terms of contestability due process, not always about privacy, but think of, can I see why I didn't get this job? Or is it somewhere in the underground? Hmm? And that has, the, the transparency has drawbacks, so that's why I think, um, instead of all the time thinking about privacy, maybe we should start researching transparency because you can have definitely too much transparency. But that is too general a statement. What does it mean to have too much transparency? Does it mean that we then, uh, that our data are monetized by others and we don't know? Or does it mean that we say, wow, now I'm beginning to realize what is being done with my data. I'm against this, actually. I already know people who say, I'm not using an iPhone because profiles are built with my data, which normalize profiles, and which allow people to target outliers. So we have to rethink transparency at a more concrete and level and also connected with computer science, because I believe that computer scientists are continuously developing solutions to what can be solved, but not to the problems. And if you tell them, yeah, but that's not the problem, the problem is this, they say, yeah, but you can't solve that problem. Okay, but shall we then try to invest more attention into what we really need to solve? And that is also connected to uh, the transparency issue. Okay, so thank you again for your interesting keynote. Sí. A last question. Yes, thank you, thank you. A, a very small question. You skipped the purpose limitations, but <laughs> if I look at um, privacy by design, personal data management, I, I do have the impression that we are shifting a lot of, let's say, responsibilities to producers, to consumers. And so my question is, who has, in fact, the ownership of purpose limitations when it comes to the essence? Can we shift that so much to producers and, and, and consumers? I'm, I'm sort of worried when I look at uh, what is happening in the industry, uh, also very much in information-driven government now, that uh, purpose binding is slowly moving out. It's much easier to talk about privacy because everybody understands. If you start talking about purpose binding, and I must honestly admit that I left out that part because it's so much more complex, it's, it's tougher, it's more, um, 
It would have taken the entire lecture to go into that, and half of you would have probably slept through uh, the lecture, which is, you know, it's air-conditioned, so it might be nice. But um, when you look at the discussion of the Article 29 Working Party over the proposal in Article 6.4 of the regulation, which says that if you have a new legal ground that is not comp of which, while your purpose of processing, so your reuse of data, is not compatible with the original, then that is allowed, as long as it's not uh, the F-ground legitimate uh, interests of the data controller. Now, I can understand the reasons why this is in the regulation, but it also takes the teeth out of purpose binding, because as soon as you have, I mean, governments are now putting together so many data to, to check you for social security fraud, water usage data in the Netherlands are lawfully used to frame whether you are receiving social security illegally, et cetera, et cetera. Difficult, very difficult, but very important. Y si os parece a los participantes de la siguiente mesa redonda y el coordinador, y daríamos paso ya a la misma sin solución de continuidad. Gracias.